different forms of value, like uh, use value, exchange value. In academia, I attempted to add one category, bluff value. No, no, it's not you, it's myself I'm criticizing. We, intellectuals, often like a text which in an easy way allows you then to participate in a debate without really knowing about it, you know. Like people talk about Lacan, you look at some quick introduction, which, and your text is excellent on that, you know, like I can throw around remarks, oh, but don't you know how this category in Marx is doubtful death and so on. But on the other hand, now comes another reversal, as it always should with me. I think there is no shame in beginning by bluffing, you know. I don't believe in this instant enlightenment. I don't trust people who tell me, for example, I just open, opened Hegel's phenomenology and read it. No, we cannot. You must be a genius if you can do it. The way to read really difficult authors, or even Marx, I think that if you don't have a Hegelian and so on education, you cannot really read Grundrisse fragments. So, it's a quite honorable thing to believe, with, to begin with a text with a good bluff value, as it were. And then you pass on to the original and so on. And it's also, if I may... Uh, my God, you really want to terrorize me going <laughs> even into that, yes. Yeah. It's even uh, an example of what I yesterday saw that signifier inconsistency in the other and... Uh, Sorry. Uh, uh, uh. Okay. Uh, yes, I just wanted to. Oh my God! I'm so sorry. I, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm basically a filthy liberal. You know, I all the time make fun. Like I was in Korea, and I was assigned a research assistant, and systematically I called him my slave, and so on. No. But then I helped him a lot. I was absolutely paranoid of not giving him anything to do and so on, you know. So I, I really... Okay, so let me go on. Uh, you know, here, one further point of interest here is uh, that, you remember, this place is the place of truth. Now, you should... It's very simple what I will tell you, but it's important, I think. You should distinguish here truth from knowledge, even if it's true or false knowledge. Jean-Claude Miller does this in a nice way when he, in one of his manuscripts, distinguishing be distinguishes between truth as a predicate, true, is this true or not, and substantialize the truth. Predicate is a truth as predicate, I simplify very much, refers to how do we call it, in Aristotelian, okay, Latin Aristotelian terms, uh, adequatio or exactitude, you know, like, is it raining outside? I go outside, if it's raining, then it's true. This is truth as adequatio. Adequacy of my statement to the state of things described by this statement. But then, already Hegel, complicates things here, where he says, this is the ordinary truth, but the true, true immanent truth of a thing is the opposite, it's the adequatio of the thing to its notion. Now people usually think this is crazy Hegel's idealism. I claim absolutely no. For, uh, for example, what Hegel has in mind is something very simple. For example, uh, Take this table, if this table were to be shaken, falling apart, and so on, you would have the full right to say, but this is not truly a table. Table in its external reality doesn't fit its notion. Now, I'm so sad I don't have the time to go into it, because I'm making a little bit of a propaganda. I hope he will not block the book or whatever. In my book to appear, by Bloomsbury Disparities, I have a long chapter debating in detail Robert Brandom, you know, Pittsburgh Hegelians, reading which is available online of 
Hegel's phenomenology of spirit. And I think my problem with Brandom is that he is unfortunately part of what I call this effort to renormalize Hegel. It's quite an honorable undertaking, but the idea is this one. If you read Hegel immediately, all that stuff, you, whatever, his crazy statements, uh, uh, although you must be, again, even here very careful, you know, Hegel, whatever you say about him, he is not an idiot. By idiot, I mean even in his empirical predictions and so on. My God, look at what Hegel in his intro, uh, forward to the philosophy of history says about America, United States and Russia. And this was written, or rather conference written down by his pupils in 1820s. He says that it's too early to develop the concept of those countries. 20th century will belong to these two countries. Haha, <laughs> it's not so bad, admit it, to say, <laughs> in 1800. Then uh, he gives so many indications that it's a total misreading to read his absolute knowing as, oh, now he knows everything and so on. Just read closely Hegel's philosophy of nature. And that's my secret perverse temptation. <coughs> you know, the usual reading of Hegel is something like this. He is good in his concrete historical analysis, you know, development of art, politics, French, blah, blah. His logic is so-so, but his philosophy of nature is romantic madness. Now, you can imagine, it's so predictable, I'm getting boring, what I'm tempted with to say. With Hegel, the problem is that his art analysis and so on are totally outdated. His logic is better, but Hegel at his best is philosophy of nature. <laughs> And uh, I'm not just kidding. What Hegel, I was shocked at how what Hegel says about, uh, how is it called? for example, about life. When do we get a living organism? What is life? This, the way he describes this minimal circular movement, minimal self-reference. In order for an object to be alive, it has to immanently relate to itself. Even some American, uh, uh, how are they called, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 Protestant theologists, I think it was Peter Inwangen, I'm not sure, ha have a wonderful idea when they claim that in non-living nature there are really no objects, like this table. Is it an object? Of course, you will say it is, but no, because let's say there is uh, somehow this metal part is attached to that one, but nothing changes if I pull it apart. They are just in a totally indifferent way, one connected to the other. So in what, or, or for example, is this one object, but when I do this, is there any imminent change in it? Absolutely nothing. So he says to speak about unity, it already must be a minimum of life in it. And Hegel, and now you will say, no, it's not simply idealism. It's quite shocking to read the best materialist, evolutionary thinkers like uh, Stephen Jay Gould and so on, who almost unknowingly refer to Hegel here. I, I dealt with this, I will try now again, uh, years ago, especially with, with self-awareness of consciousness. That's a problem which is so interesting. It's more and more a problem in brain scientists, sciences. Do you know why? It's very simple. The more, you know, the goal of, let's say, brain sciences is to naturalize our mind, to show how, to put it in vulgar terms, it's all really about neuronal uh, processes, uh, electromagnetic, whatever you want there. And then, but the problem is that the more you succeed, that is to say, the more you are able to translate or reduce a properly conscious human act to natural, to no natural, no nature, we 
discovered this two days ago, to, to, to simply a uh, positive physical process, the more the enigma remains, but why then do we need awareness at all? You know what I mean? What, for example, when they talk about a certain complex mental act, what science does, pretty successfully, I'm impressed by it, is to so reduce it to its neuronal whatever material support. But then the question is, why then awareness? What do we gain by it? And here problems emerge. Because uh, the usual trick, even Daniel Dennett, who usually is not totally stupid, falls for it, is to claim that with a certain complexity, you need something like awareness. You know, when mental process or whatever reaches certain complexity, it cannot be just blind natural process. You need awareness. Now, I'm not totally bluffing here. I mm -hmm. talked with some of them. And they all admitted to me that, if anything, all intelligent brain scientists will tell you, it's exactly the opposite. If there is a function of consciousness, it's the reduction. The function of consciousness is not, oh, it's too complex, now I have to think about it. No. Our pre-conscious, unconscious, I don't know how to call them because it's not the Freudian unconscious, but what goes on in our brain, even at the level of our reasoning we are unaware of, is infinitely more complex. And the big function of consciousness is to simplify it, to reduce it to just a couple of features of the feature. And this would be the beauty of it for me, to claim how the great art is not complexity, the great art of thinking is the right simplification. Like this is even my problem with some kind of, okay, today they are no longer fashionable, they were when I was young, this uh, deconstructionist approach. Not so much Derrida, he was more intelligent, but many of his imitators reduced basically deconstruction to endless variations of a statement, something like, but the situation is endlessly more complex. You know, like, you say this, ah, no, it's more complex, and so on. I mean, I think that, no, the, what I'm saying, the big mystery, as it were, is not complexity as such, but it's the right simplification of complexity. And even at the level of truth, for me as a Hegelian, you should totally forget here about the wrong reading of Hegel as a thinker of totality, where totality is usually perceived as, you know, like, you have to take into account all the side, all, even uh, Lenin says many stupid things like this, although at some point in his uh, uh, philosophical, how do you call it, not lessons, notebooks. how do you translate, notebooks, yeah, yeah, he almost gets the point. No, really, I think with all my respect for Lenin, you know, you can clearly see if you know Hegel, what's, he what's Lenin's limit? It's Wechselwirkung, uh, mutual reaction. Hegel's limit is everything reacts, self-reacts through other and so on, uh, he doesn't get, so, okay, uh, now comes the crucial speculative point, and ha ha ha, surprise you, you think I again went nuts and lost my thread, I didn't. This will bring me well back to that Hegel's idea, table, notion, and so on. The greatness of Hegel, the speculative greatness, and I think we can read it in a materialistic way, is because now you will say, okay, of course I can say a table is a bad table, but is this immanent to the table, or is this just my subjective evaluation of it? The standard position, and even uh, uh, Brandon falls short here, is to claim that no, it's just my subjective evaluation that there is no, if I may call it like this, normative dimension in external reality. You know, like, uh, if this table is like this, or this leg twisted, the table in itself, if we can imagine it, is totally indifferent towards it. 
It's when I judge the table, appreciate it, with regard to, with reference to how it was planned, why it was produced, what are its uses, that I can say this table does not fit its notion. The greatness of Hegel here, I cannot go into it, is to claim no, from the very beginning there is normativity in reality. But not in some crazy idealist sense. For example, the whole Hegel, and he is wonderful there, uh, theory of life, plants, animals, is that plants, like trees and all that bullshit, no, here I have a minimum of friendliness towards, it will, hor will be horrible what I will tell you now, but I love it. You know, at one or two points, I was very sympathetic to Ronald Reagan. Uh, I hate him, don't <laughs> miss us there. Once, you know, he was attacked that he allows too much uh, cutting of trees, no? And he says, I claim in a very Hegelian way, what's the point? You see one tree, you've seen them all, you know? <laughs> <What's> the <laughs> <problem>? <laughs> oh, sorry. The other statement by Reagan that I loved is when uh, he was once accused of <coughs> <coughs> tolerating at his table that many of his friends were Holocaust deniers. And you know what was his defense? That it's not true whenever at his dinner table there are people who claim that there was no Holocaust. He always protests and claims, okay, there was a slight problem with this, no? What kind of friends does he have if he has to defend all the time <laughs> the fact that there was a Holocaust. No. But okay, let's go back. So, uh, Hegel's theory of plants is that he gives a wonderful, okay, it's crazy metaphor, this is not science, definition of a plant, that a plant is an animal whose entrails are thrown outside itself into the earth. So, the point is this one, through natural selection and so on, you can read this in a totally objective way. Uh, roots and so on, the way plants multiply, feed themselves, they try to achieve something, but they fail and simply, through the natural trial and error, to resolve the deadlock of plants, animals emerged, and so on and so on, <laughs> up to humanity and so on. I mean, uh, uh, even, uh, and uh, even generally, that's Hegel's point. Why is he a true dialectician? For example, if you take the notion of state, Hegel's idea is not a simple development, primitive, despotic state, democratic state, whatever. His idea is that a state tries to resolve a certain problem. Okay, let's put it in abstract way, how to keep, Marxist way even, how to keep together an antagonistic society. And for Hegel, all existing states are repeated examples which always fail to resolve this dilemma. Primitive, uh, primitive, not primitive, they were very developed. What Marx called Asiatic mode of production, this oriental despotic systems, try to keep together society in a certain way. It ultimately failed. Slave society, medieval society, capitalist society. The, as Hegel would have put it precisely, no state, no actual empirical state succeeds to be at its own level as the state. And now comes the beauty of Hegel. You will say, but at the end, in the vision of the rational state that you find in Hegel's, uh, uh, um, in Hegel's uh, philo Recht philosophy, philosophy of law, there he does design an ideal state. No, absolutely not. Total misreading of Hegel. First, remember something. It's a, I don't trust him. When we people, I hope it use fusing together, we take power, would you send at least for a couple of years to Gulag uh, uh, Robert Pippin, no? For his <laughs> liberal deviations. But one, one thing he did observe, that's why he will not get that penalty, maybe. He made a wonderful observation. You know, one of the most often quoted passages of Hegel, where he says that the only thing philosophy can do is paint grey on grey. That philosophy can only bring to notion describe the 
conceptual structure of a certain social formation once its time has passed. And then Pippin asks the obvious question, and maybe I don't know enough Hegel, no irony here, no arrogant irony. Maybe somebody already noted this, but from my limited knowledge, Pippin was the first to know this, to note this. What? But if Hegel wasn't a complete idiot, wasn't it clear to him that the same should hold for his own philosophy of right? That he simply describes a certain ideal form of state whose moment was already missed by this further development of civil society which drew Hegel nuts. He was, you know, it's so interesting to note, Marxist noted this long ago, that the last article, I think, so written by Hegel, notes on the reform bill, English, it's a, it's a text of panic. My God, what are they doing? Something new is... He doesn't get it, and so on. So, uh, maybe we should change this, that Hegel at the end... You know what Hegel's solution? When you get state which fits its notion, it's no longer a state. You pass into religion, religious community. Of course, but you see, Hegel's point is not at the end you get finally reality which fits its notion. No, no, with Hegel, when reality fits its notion, the notion itself falls apart and you go into uh, another notion. Also, people usually complain about how uh, Hegel describes this inertia of bourgeois society, organic uh, harmony, everybody at his her job. Yeah, but Hegel adds something, you know. And I think there was a deep truth in it, not just military propaganda. The truth of the entire history is war for Hegel. At the end, it's war as absolute horizon of history. And against Kant's idea of perpetual peace, Hegel emphasizes this. And I think it's too easy to say because Hegel's horizon was bourgeois, he didn't know how to pass over it and so on and so on. I think that, I think that uh, I, the way I try to read Hegel in my 1000 pages book on Hegel is rather, you know, my favorite Thomas Jefferson quote, you know that uh, uh, freedom is the tree which needs to be watered by blood uh, from time to time. I think what one should do is just somehow to replace uh, this external tension, war, with imminent one, with revolution. With, okay, but I will not go into it now. All I want to say is this. Let's go to that original point, uh, which is that for I don't think there is a wrong idealism in this notion that a certain normativity, a tension between how things are and how they ought to be, but ought to be not in the sense of abstract morality, but in what they really are, are is immanent to reality itself. It's the tension that makes reality. So now I will repeat another of my old ideas. Without this tension, you cannot understand Hegel's central category of concrete universality, which is something today, of course, more important than ever. In what sense? He, the, here I'm grateful to Fred Jameson, who developed this in a wonderful anti-post-colonial way, brutally attacking all those jerks who preach alternate modernity. Like Fred Jameson, I'm totally opposed to this category. I think it's the most dangerous category you can imagine. Why? To cut a long story short, what's the idea of, uh, of uh, alternate modernity? It's basically to simplify it, but I don't think I even simplify it a lot. Something like this. We in the West had a certain form of capitalist modernity. Let's call it liberal with all organic disunity, class struggle and so on and so on. And then the idea is but we can do it in another way, by still maintaining, keeping what is, to put it naively, good about modernity, development, productive forces, but without paying the price for it. 
without uh, uh, social disintegration and so on and so on. So, as Fred ironically says, now every nation epoch can have, we have Latino American modernity, Asian modernity, African modernity, whatever, but then Fred makes the right remark. The mistakes, what you do in this way, although the insight is the right one, which is this eternal anti-essentialist nominalist move, but we should never forget, neither Hegel nor Marx, none of them were nominalists. Nominalism means to say, and I hate feminists who say this, you know, like, this is even one of my advices if you are part of a feminist debate, but not just feminist debate, I'm sorry about this, Every day that, uh, I experienced it like this, that we debated about femininity and then when somebody is losing, one safe strategy is to say, but there is no woman, what woman are we talking about? There are only black, lesbian, single mother, women, and so on and so on, and you think you are saying something wise with this. No, I think the situation is different, in what sense? Let me return to different capitalisms. Of course it's true that there is not one capitalism. There is Western liberal capitalism, the Japanese military modernization which started after that Meiji restoration, whatever, and all that. Uh, there are of course different capitalisms. But, haha, what this, the idea of alternate modernity, what it obfuscates, in its false empiricism is that it reduces the fundamental antagonism which defines capitalism, which is, to put it in Hegelian terms, part of the very notion of capitalism, it reduces it just to a contingency of a certain historical form of capitalism. The ideological dream, at least of the predominant form of alternate modernity theories, is we can have capitalism without its antagonisms. That's why, and this is my ultimate argument against alternate modernity, we in Europe, I'm sorry to tell you, we already had in the first part of 20th century, and now it's maybe returning, a big form of alternate modernity. It's called fascism. Fascism is exactly an alternate modernity. The idea is, if we get rid of the Jews or whoever, we can have capitalism. You know that fascism was never simply reactionary, it was ultra-technological progress, but without paying the price for it. So, what's then the position of concrete universality? Capitalism as concrete universality means what? It means that there is a universality of capitalism, which cannot be reduced to just this, what Hegel or, and Marx call this uh, flat, blind universality. The universality of capitalism, you don't arrive at it in such a way that you simply compare different capitalisms and universalize. What do they have in common? No. The universal notion of capitalism is the notion of a basic antagonism. And each particular form of capitalism vaguely if we distinguish them. I don't know, liberal capitalism, fascism, populist capitalism, welfare state, is a different version of trying to cope with the general antagonism. So you see the beauty. A, uh, it's not that particular elements fight each other while the general notion is a kind of an empty container. No, the Hegelian concept is the opposite one. The tension is not between particular elements. The tension is between each particular element and its universality. The true tension is between each form of capitalism and its own notion. Like, liberal capitalism tries to cope with the capitalist antagonism when it fails another. So you see my point. To explain the multiplicity of capitalisms, it's not enough to play one against the other. You must have a reference to some universality, which again, is the universality of an antagonism. It's a beautiful idea that, uh, again, it runs against our common sense notion, according to which universality is the peace of totality. 
you know, like, oh, there, it's only difference, but then particular elements fight against each other. No, I think even we have to read Marx it this way. Capitalism as such is in its very concept branded marked by certain immanent tension and all concrete forms try to cope with this tension and it's this, and this, this is what one way to read what Hegel calls concrete universality. It's a universality which is not just a neutral container of its particular forms, but uh, you, I, I put it like this. You need to refer to universality as antagonism precisely in order to understand properly the particularity of each particular form as a specific way to cope with this universality and so on and so on. In this sense, again, I, <coughs> I claim that all this, that's the, the wonder of Hegel. He, even his most abstract, crazy speculations can be read, like here, in a very materialist way. So, let me return to what I was saying. I didn't uh, lose my thread. Uh, I, uh, uh, yes, I was there with the truth the distinction between truth as substantial truth and the true as predicate. Now I remember, I'm restoring the chain, the missing clinch. I begin the detour of my madness by emphasizing how uh, the truth is not just the truth of, like, I say outside it's raining, but the truth of the thing itself. Thus, for Hegel, dialectical progress is unthinkable without this normative tension within each concept, sorry, within each, within so-called external reality uh, itself. So now uh, there is another point that I wanted to make here. Then we have another type of opposition. It's true as a predicate and tr substantive truth. And for Lacan, it's crucial there that truth as the place of truth is not the place of objective knowledge, truth about things. It's truth as a subjective, subjective position. And the whole of psychoanalysis relies on this point. You cannot understand at least not the two hysterical positions, hysteria and obsession neurosis, without this gap between knowledge and vaguely, let's say, by knowledge I mean true knowledge, reporting how things really, really are, and truth as the subjective position. To cut a long story short, and I simplify it immensely, truth, sorry, uh, hysteria, I simplify it, but in a way it holds, hysteria is a lie, a lie at the level of predicate, you claim what is not true, but it's a lie through which subjective truth articulates itself. And uh, a stupid example, I'm embarrassed to mention them, just to give Let's say uh, I, I am tired and uh, sick of you, which is not true, I love you really, <laughs> if you believe, yeah. But, uh, and instead of saying, when, quarter of an hour ago, uh, okay, let's begin, it's so stupid, it's too him. I, I were to say, okay, let's conclude. Now, you see, I, it is not true, I was wrong, but isn't it that quite a lot of my subjective position, basically this to you, no, would have appeared if I were to say this. You see, it's how, but that's the whole point of Freud, through slips of tongue, through mistaken statements and so on, your subjective truth, the truth about where you are, where you stand as a desiring person, uh, articulates itself. While, to put it in very simplistic terms, with obsessional neurosis, it's the opposite. It's a lie in the guise of truth. You know, obsessional neurotics in this sense can be very good sadists, I think. Not in the strict clinical sense, but you know, like, uh, I tell you things which may be true, but the whole of the investment of it is 
some kind of a lie to humiliate you, to dupe you, or whatever. You know, that's how true liars are proceeding. They don't lie directly. Everything they say is true, factually. But the effect is that of a lie, and so on. Either most simple level, for example, it's stupid. But even Kant, the great lover of truth, you know, Kant even has that crazy example in one of his short texts, that uh, how you never, never should lie, how somebody knocks on your door and uh, it's your friend and you know your friend is innocent and you hide him, then the murderers who want to kill him knock on the door, is that guy here? And Kant says, even if you know that your friend is innocent, you should not lie to them. I think Kant is uh, simplified here. He didn't mean that, but what I want to say is this. So it would be very interesting to look in Kant himself, because there are three levels at which he nonetheless allows a lie. You know, we should always look for exceptions. The first one is politeness. In his wonderful text on anthropology and so on, he goes into how now, this will be very aggressive. I don't know whom of you. You, because you're an evil guy with this. Let's say I see you, and let's say you are dying of cancer and so on, you know. But I, and you look like, if I may use a Slovene metaphor, I love it. You look as if I pulled you out of the ass of a cow, you know. Like this is beautiful, authentic Slovene metaphor, you know. So, uh, but Kant says... It would be, if I were to tell you, look, what's happening to you, you look like you will drop dead, and so on. You know, it's true, but, you know, it's not subjective truth. It's an open aggressivity, and so on, here, and so on. Uh, so, you, we shouldn't lie here, at this level. So you should tell me you look great. Sorry? You should tell me you look great. Uh, no, yes, but it's much more refined situation here, because <coughs> Kant is not simply saying you should lie. I think Kant is much more intelligent and is aiming at something about which Kant writes in a very nice way in his anthropology. This is the mystery of politeness. You know that you are close to death. I know that you know we all know. So if I say this, it's not... Oh my God! Oh my God! Are you... Oh my God! I don't like this. Oh no, I'm all right, but what happened oh was the chair went up, and I'm bleeding. It, it kept, oh, my oh, my oh, my oh, my God. Oh, my God. The chair went up, and I didn't realize it myself. Oh, my God. It's broken. What's broken? Her oh, Is it? No. Her lips. Okay, there's some yeah. paper bandages without the I want uh, some Kleenexes or something. They've gone to fetch me. They've gone to fetch Kleenexes. This is crazy. No, I mean, she wanted to get up and get out, and I didn't realize it. It happened to me quite often. My speaker is still But I'm all right. I mean, I'm too. No, no, but is the leap. Uh, wait a minute. One thing, it's really broken or it's just. It's, it's bleeding. It's bleeding. Yeah, bleeding. Okay, but. Did it rip open? I'm so sorry. I just sorry. wanted the attention. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> No, no. No, but this no is you know what I will tell you now, in a loving way. You know my favorite Goebbels statement, which was used by already, already uh, Karl Lueger, when people reproached Goebbels, no Goebbels, sorry, uh, Himmler for, he saved one Jew in 42 because that Jew was his private masseur. And hardline Nazis reproached him, what, why are you saving the Jew? And Himmler said, in this city I decide who is a Jew or not. So, in this city, I decide if you committed a sleep or not. No, it was not a Friday to sleep, you know, you didn't want that. It's crazy. I'm glad I didn't lose my teeth because my teeth kind of feel a little bit numb. But uh, if you uh, move it, does it shake? Or is it... Uh -huh. I mean, I'm not here making... F if anything, I'm making fun of you. Look! Oh, everything is artificial here with me, everything. Part is just artificial in a fixed way, and the upper part is like, I am a legend. Once I showed myself to my friend, without, I will not do it to you without it, and I look so horrible, 
that I learned that those okay. friends of mine who yeah. have a small kid even now used me as, you know, if you'll not be a good boy, that uncle will come and so on. Oh my God. It's okay. Is it? Thank you. Yeah, it's it's okay. Okay. No, I'm perfectly all right. No, but I just, uh, I feel so bad. a dramatic moment here. But, uh, no, the chair just came up and I sat down without it. Yeah, but these chairs are evil. You have to <laughs> take it. I, I hate nature. I hate chairs. <laughs> so well, this is... Um, it's an example of life and nature. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. Are you sure? My I am. Thank you very much. Uh, do you really want to stay here? Nobody will blame you <laughs> if you use <laughs> this as no, an excuse. No, make me laugh. No. Stay. Stay. No, okay. Stay until okay. it okay. stops Okay. 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 But yeah. at any point you can... She wants some wipes. Antiseptic. What is this? Antiseptic wipes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what else? Oh my God. No. Well, That's fantastic. Plastic. Wow, okay. Plastic, fantastic. Isn't this an old Jefferson airplane song? Or what? Okay, but that's not. <laughs> no, no, it's. Uh, you know, this is unfortunately what we may call. Oh, you've said you got as far as politeness. Yeah, 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 I will, I will. Although, you know, for a brief moment, don't take this personally, I thought it's a magic disappearance trick, you know? <laughs> you are here, oh, oh, you are nowhere. <laughs> Don't and then I asked, I said, like, only one person stepped out. How come <laughs> did two persons disappear? I thought, are you really two or is just a redoubled one? Sorry, I cannot resist it, you know. Uh, no, but it's stupid when this happens. And it's uh, good, like, if things to me at my age happen falling down, I need quite some time to, you know, I have to put it, now I'm making fun of myself. You know this Husserl phenomenological idea that ego constructs itself through phenomenological constitution, no? After a fall like yours, I would have needed some half an hour phenomenologically to re reconstruct, to reform myself, you know, to become an ego again. <laughs> I put it, no? That's, that's how, uh, pe this is the difference of the people. I am an instant paranoiac. I wake up in the morning, I function. My wife needs half an hour to become human. She has to go to this Husserlian process yeah. of reconstitution of the ego complex and so on. I'm, I, I feel bad because I feel responsible, no, my God. So do I. <laughs> Why? I don't know. You asked me to get up because she had to go to the bathroom. I mean, this is total nature. This is nature. And you are Russian, no? Know. You are Russian. I know. It's <laughs> it KGB? Uh, now finally things are clear, yeah. It's not you. You go to I Gulag. Know. You yes, go to Gulag. And you will write a long, thick confession. Will it be enough to sentence me to death? No. No. <laughs> we will not sentence you to death because you will make a sincere confession. What no. Ah, I knew. You fell in my trap. It, we I good Stalinists have a very precise definition of sincere. Okay. Nothing to do with sincerity. Sincere means you will imply your parents and your friends and your children. <laughs> and then maybe you will not get the death penalty. Except if, as in good Stalinist trials, you yourself will demand it. Ah. Sorry, it's enough, let's go on. But please interrupt me if anything uh, happens. Okay, <coughs> where was I? Truth. Politeness, so politeness. Yes, one. yeah, yeah, yeah. So listen, uh, my old example, I'm sorry if you know it. Let's say I meet you, you, you. Let's say I meet you on the street. When I meet, when I meet you, I say, of course, how are you? Nice to see you. Both of us know that I am just cursing myself that I didn't see you five seconds before to cross to the other side of the street and that I don't care how are you. But we, and in a way, we both know about it. You know what I mean? Like, I always have this experience, sorry if I repeat myself here, especially in New York, if you go to restaurants, the waiter asks you, how are you guys today, and so on. The first time I went there in 85, I think, in the United States, I was an idiot, I thought it's a serious question. <laughs> and I said, oh, not too good, I just uh, have a jet lag. And the guy, he was right, the waiter, for a brief moment, he looked at me as if I'm crazy, you know, like, what is this guy talking about, no? I, so, what I'm saying, you see, this is the mystery of, uh, of communication. We both know it's a lie, but it's in a way a sincere lie. 
It's not a hypocrisy. Or to put it in a more convoluted way. When, even if you look like pulled out of the asses, uh, 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 cow's ass and so on, <laughs> just to remind you who you are. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, even we both know it. So the true meaning of me to say, when I say, oh, you look nice, is a simple gesture of benevolence. If you want to explicate it, it's something like, I'm sad for you, I know you look bad, but I really wish you all the well. Some bo you know what I mean? Like, it's not, it functions in a much more reflexive, convoluted way. And that's the mystery, sorry, that's the mystery of politeness. Can I say something yeah. here? Because I'm really interested in your arguments against recognition with Brando. And their reading of that moment would be, I mean, you know what it is, that, that that's the initial moment when you lift out from the empirical onto the level of the notion. Because it's a moment of the initial recognition upon which all sociality is built. But you also have some reservations about recognition yeah. as the telos of uh, state construction and the emancipatory struggle. And but uh, I never heard your full argument about uh, that. It will be, I'm so sorry to squeeze out in the third chapter of my new book, Disparities. Okay. But uh, uh, no, you know where is my basic problem? There are two. Mm. The first one is, and here the reference again to four discourses would be actual. Were you responsible or what? No. <laughs> no, I'm still in my Stalinist mode looking. Somebody must be guilty. You know. uh, because if we don't find the culprit, then people will say that the Communist Party is responsible. But they are. You really want to feel yes. in gulag? Yes. All my sympathy. No, sorry, let's go. So, what I want to say is that the basic hypothesis of Lacan is double. A. Every discourse social link is grounded in a gesture of a master. That is to say, Brandon still participates or sustains this Habermasian point that as to its immanent normativity, communication is a reciprocal equal, no? And that every relationship of domination is a kind of a distortion of genuine communication. I claim that no, in order to have any communication, you need a gesture of the master to set up, the, in a way, to define the very space of where we communicate. And this is always a violent gesture. I don't think there is ever a neutral space of communication. That's my first problem, which brings me to the second problem, and here we come to the analyst discourse and so on. Uh, I think that, oh yeah, second point, I even have three points with reference to Habermasians. Second point, and precisely it would refer to, uh, norma to, to normativity and politeness. Habermas's idea is that there is a certain normativity, he defines it at three levels, basically. First, sincerity in the sense of that you really mean what you are saying. Second point, exactitude, that what you are saying is truthful, and then argument, and so on. But uh, my point is this one. I don't think that Habermas's reading is a correct one. I claim that what he describes as, and then, you know, Habermas's point is that every speech act, or rather communication, has inscribed into it this immanent normativity. So that the world in which we live, in which we lie, we use language to dominate and so on, is a kind of a distorted communication. Yeah, because it calls it ideal speech situation. Yeah, yeah. I claim that in, and it's an empirical disagreement, that what he refers to has originally the status of a consensual lie. It doesn't have this normative status. Like, uh, that, uh, and it's wonderful to read intelligent uh, cognitivists like Daniel Dennett at his best and so on, when they prove how, if anything, language was created for lying, much more than to reveal what we are for cover up. You know, like for me, for example, let's return to that. Oh, you are 
cause ash and so on but you look yeah I re- you notice how i enjoy to repeat it to repeat it. yeah yeah i want to do you have enough you want me to go on again cows ash cows ash okay that's right no what i want to say is this that it's wrong to say that when i it's wrong to say to read here this normativity i think that the normativity of politeness is simply even if we know how it is let's pretend let's act as if it's not that this gap ignoring the reality is absolutely immanent to human communication it's always part of a communication and you always find it in all entitlements and so on i will give you another example you find it in sosir a beautiful one sosir says that how let's say we have a train which we call 450 to birmingham and so here says that how does this designation function it identifies the train more than at an empirical level let's say the train is late and it's not illogical to say the 450 to birmingham will depart at 5:30 you see that gap is absolutely constitutive you cannot uh, you cannot reduce it to just imperfect communication or whatever or whatever or whatever language and uh, i love uh, uh, but uh, again however much should read uh, uh, intelligent cognitivists where they demonstrate also how uh, also how how language is much more than habermas allows for always self reflexive in what sense uh, for example you know the beautiful uh, uh, cognitivist explication of how are those i forgot the english word sorry the stupid animal with many beautiful big feathers the animal peacock peacock, 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 peacock boasting that so on <laughs> you know what a beautiful very simple evolutionary explanation of it because idiots would have said you know wait a minute obviously if you have such big feathers you don't scare anyone it definitely doesn't make you fight better and so on so what's the evolutionary advantage and the explanation is a wonderful one is that the message in the process of seduction it's not simply oh look i am i have all those beautiful feathers the message is look how strong i am I can afford all these stupid feathers which make me extremely clumsy and still I can fight and survive. You know, it this the message is the very uselessness of it. It as evolutionists say here they become a little bit to simplify that it's for the same reason that when we sorry if I will make it sound may chauvinist that when we give a present to a woman beloved it has to be a useless present like if you get you don't agree now i will be a racist no, i like to maybe you in russia give as a present hot <laughs> underwear or whatever my friends with hot underwear first of all i was raised in holland so i'm more dutch than russian however uh, uh, were you uh, were your grandparents illegitimate descendants of peter the great could be yeah yeah because he was there sorry stay back now let's be serious stay back that presents are necessary u- useless i mean how do you define useless what do you mean useless for what in a in a in a evolutionary sense of survival no no not necessarily like you know the the thing that you have to write that's not that's not useless she i've got a good example yeah. my father made a very bad mistake he okay. bought my mother what well, i thought i thought yeah. that mistake <laughs> is you <laughs> you you when he came <laughs> sorry i cannot resist my nature sorry please go on yes that's the original <laughs> mistake yeah. He made a very bad mistake and I think it's the point you're trying to make he, my, he, my mother had complained at some point about the hairs on her legs and he bought her for Christmas a lady shape Well that's just rude Well this is what you're talking about but that's useful <laughs> Yeah because it was useful No no that's, yes. no, that's just a man That was that was a, that was a no, useful gift not. in his mind Okay but tell me what is the use value of a uh, big <laughs> diamond Well it has a monetary value first of all if <laughs> I, I agree but it's no no I mean what's the difference cuts thing 
things with it. Sorry? No, that, no, don't be serious. Be serious. Yes, you can, but don't tell me that when you're lover and with your attitude, I doubt if you have one. What is that? <laughs> no, serious, I am. Don't tell me that when a lover gives you a diamond, you will say, oh, useful, I have to cut that metal and it will. Have you read Great Yes, and it's a great... No, but seriously, what I want to say is nonetheless that isn't this the basic point in presence? They must be in some sense useless. Yes. No, Let's because sometimes you give things, like it was explained in that famous book, what's that called, um, about the psychology of persuasion? Presents have a very, there's an evolutionary aspect to giving presents. There's a Which is what? There's a reason, well, you give a present, for example, if you want something back, it makes people psychologically more ready to give something back. Ah, that's another mystery. Okay, let's drop this, I agree. But here, I warn you, I'm half a specialist, because I met the guy, What's you must know him, Marshall Sennings who goes, he has the most beautiful theory of all this potlatch exchange. You know what's the mystery of potlatch? Mm -hmm. This potlatch are this mega primitive, like two tribes. How do they retain friendship? I invite, no, no, it's more vulgar. Mm -hmm. I invite your tribe, we eat like pigs and so on. Mm -hmm. Then you are expected after some time to invite my tribe. Okay. We eat like pigs. Okay, the mystery is this way. It's clearly an exchange, but it does, it's strictly prohibited for it to appear as an exchange. If you make it a direct exchange, you are considered extremely rude. Like, you organize a potluck, big orgy, I come there and I tell, oh, do you want it next week? Like, if I treat it directly as an exchange, you know, the mystery is this one, that you, if you invite me, you offer me uh, something as a gift, uh, but gift by definition means you just give it, no? And then I have to offer you back a gift. But we have both to pretend that these are two voluntary gifts. The moment you make an exchange out of it, it's uh, finished. And it's a very interesting, uh, uh, it's a very interesting, but another point, I mean, sorry. Shop when I came from Argentina in Europe was the fact that you know when you ask when you take a French or a coffee, the French thing that is to pay you the coffee back. You know, there is not this idea that you can give something without an exchange. No, I know, and here this is much more in Argentina. In Argentina, I mean, I came with the idea that you know you sometimes you treat someone, for instance, you just a simple act of a coffee. Yeah, but this is very different in different European countries. France is a special case. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it, you know, also in what sense? Here in the UK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, for example, because in France, I noticed this as coming from an old socialist country. In our socialist countries, we always made fun of policemen as extremely stupid and corrupted. Mm -hmm. oh, it, was, uh, it was in Slovenia, ex Yugoslavia, all around. And some of the jokes, I will not tell them, are even very well. But my point is this one. The only Western European country where they, at least 30 years ago when I lived there, where they were also making fun of policemen, uh, dismissing them as stupid and so on and so on, was France. Because with us it was permanent, like our idea was, why do you always see at least three policemen together? Because one of them knows how to read, the other one how to write, and the third one is controlling the first two. <laughs> it's stupid, but when it was absolutely permanent, this idea of uh, stupidity and corruption. And it's, again, it's only in France. But listen, I'm sorry, but let's go on here. Just to warn you about another thing. Even with, uh, I love this analysis, I don't know if it can be true. They claim that even with uh, those uh, famous stone age hammers or whatever, you know, you have a stick and a big stone on it, that you cannot account for it in simple utilitarian terms, that it has a pseudo-aesthetic dimension of both the big stone and so on and so on. In other words, the idea here is that even in 
prehistory at the most primitive level, the commodities we pr produce, I mean, I will not use contemporary terms, which are ridiculous there, like reflexivity or whatever, but have also, and here is my reaction to David, I don't know, I am not convinced by it. Is this aspect, not only of commodities, but of human products, different people call it in a different way, like some sociologists today call it sign value. Lacan sometimes calls it cult value. This reflexive information that a commodity gives you. Through buying a commodity, you redefine your status, you declare yourself as what. And uh, now, my question is, and it's not a rhetorical question, I'm not playing to you this, uh, uh, how to call it, uh, oppressive professor who asks you a question but that you only try to guess what do I want to hear from you. I really mean it. Is this an independent dimension of value which cannot be reduced either to use value or to uh, exchange value as expressing value as such? Let me give you a stupid example. Uh, but this is already an old-fashioned, it's ridiculous. When I was young, at least in communist Yugoslavia, uh, wearing jeans had a certain almost <laughs> political dimension. Communism is oppressive, I like to declare my fascination with... You defined yourself in a certain way. And it can be even more subtle, that it's not just this stupid pro-Western stance. For example, I remember, I'm unfortunately old enough, late 60s, early 70s, student revolution and so on. If we were leftists, you had to drink Pepsi. Because, no, Pepsi just because it was anti-Coke. Coke was American symbol, so you have to be Pepsi. I don't know it was the same all around the world. In Europe, a, a friend of mine who edited a book of photo memories of Rudy Dutschke, all that 66, uh, 7, he uh, demonstrated this to me. He showed it how on all the round tables they insisted they drink Pepsi, never Coke. So what I'm saying is that and uh, all this uh, level of self-presentation and what I especially like is how pseudo-use value can also be transformed into a fake use value which has nothing to do with use value. For example, I had a friend, a big doctor in Slovenia, who lived in the center of the city and mostly used his car just to get to other part of the center of the city to his hospital. But he had a Land Rover and he was ready to tell you everything, how it can climb, I don't know how many degrees. So uh, he tried to give a utilitarian justification. You know, if I go to nature, I want to be able my car to climb. But it was bullshit. It was not real use value. It was a fake use value. He wanted to be perceived to declare, present himself as somebody who doesn't care for all city niceties. He likes to be a raw guy. In a you know what I mean? <coughs> it's so elementary, you know. So uh, this aspect of every commodity to also imply a way you define your self-identity or you present yourself in a certain way. And I'm even ready to go a step further here now. I will repeat an old motive, but here I'm really evil. I think that much of all this uh, ecology, sustainable life, charity help works strictly at this level. For example, if you go to a store and buy organic apples, do I will never really believe you, at least most of you, that you really believe that... The, I always have a certain paranoia. Probably I'm wrong, I hope. But my paranoia is that, you know, they produce apples. All the nice apples, nice, organically modified and so on, they select them. Then some rotten apples remain and they simply proclaim them organic and double the price, you know. Like, okay, it's not true probably, I hope so. But what I'm saying is this, a much more crazy statement that most of you, when you buy organic apples or all the bullshit, you know, 
produced in accordance with nature, fair price, blah, blah, uh, that you don't really do it because you believe in it. You do it to declare yourself as it's a social message. To I who? To who? But you buy apples for yourself. No, you never. It's always a social act. Right, okay. Or maybe you cheat for yourself, I accept this, but I can even, ah, I have a friend, a sociologist, who did uh, an inquiry of it, and the result was this, that at least in our corrupted Slovenia, the majority of people had this attitude, you cannot be sure is it or not. But nonetheless, we should at least declare that we are ready to sacrifice something for Mother Earth and so on and so on. And I have a triumphal <coughs> confirmation of this. Some ten years ago, I gave a speech at some big philosophical reunion in Italy. And there was among the public an American lady who exploded at what I was saying. Like that, you are making fun of all this. Oh, but I was shocked at, she went on for a quarter of an hour and her basic message was how dare you talk like this, you are ruining my life, mm -hmm. I dedicated my life to charity to all this and then you know, all I had to answer her is, but are you aware what you are doing? You are talking for a quarter of an hour and you didn't even mention those people that you are allegedly helping. It was all about how it makes your life meaningful to do it. With my critique, I'm ruining your life. I'm making your life meaningless, and so on, and so on, and so on. I, so all I'm saying is that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, and again, David, I, I'm not sure, even if it's, maybe I'm making some category mistake, you know. And simply, it's not at the same level. And this is for me, as a Hegelian, the most serious mistake. In the sense that it simply doesn't belong to the same field. What I'm tempted to call sign value or cult value, this social message of self-definition. But I claim it's extremely important today. Why do you think that people are buying for example, they are now a little bit out of date, uh, Koreans are winning, but you remember some five years ago or when that Apple craze with all that iPad and so on, iPod and so on. I know of researches which confirm that, you know, all that those exquisite points, majority, it was purely a status symbol as they put it. it you declared yourself as belonging to a certain lifestyle and so on and so on and so on. And uh, uh, to mention, I cannot resist temptation to be vulgar again, what I began with, that what I ironically refer to, this is not serious, as bluff value, you know. You know, I read an excellent, uh, you know, there was immediately, there was years ago a series, that they were offered on all airports, like how to bluff your way into. And it's also a nice example of that signifier of the inconsistency of the other. It gave a very good advice. Like I bought one, how to bluff your way into classical music. And the basic advice <coughs> is an intelligent one. It is that uh, you should perplex people. Like let's take, sorry, a vulgar example, Tchaikovsky's symphonies. If you know anything, you know that four, five, six are the well-known popular ones. One to three, nobody knows them, practically. So what you should say is four, five, six are shit. The real thing <laughs> happens in third symphony. And you know, like to make this shocking choice. And even uh, like uh, this is the gesture of the master signifier proper. But to you do that, you already have to know that four, five, six are the good ones. Yeah, but that's why you read the book, How to Bluff Your Way. <laughs> no. Because, yeah, but, now I will say, yes, you have to know this, every idiot knows this. But my point is, you don't have to know what is the third symphony, which you are praising as. There was a whole industry of this 30, 40 years ago, me and Fred Jensen wanted to do a volume of it. All of us Hitchcock lovers. The point was to do a whole volume of choosing one of Hitchcock's great failures and proclaim it, that's the true masterpiece, you know, like, 
I mean, the candidates were that anti-communist, miserable movie, mm -hmm. Topaz. I opted for that one. Fred wanted the one with Marlene Dietrich, uh, State Fright, and so on. I now know what you were doing when I gave you a card of Malevich's Square during the show of Malevich's show at, at Tate Modern. Mm -hmm. During the last summer school, I gave you a present of a card of the Malavish yeah. Square, and you said, this doesn't interest me, I like the last stage, that obscure where he becomes the peasant. It's I now realize... No, you know, I like <laughs> the way the, the Chinese reason. The Chinese always talk in this percentage. I love the Chinese bureaucratic language. I remember when I was young, there was a conflict Soviet Union-China. So the official Maoist line was, this is a big conflict, it will last 1,000 years. <laughs> then relations got a little bit better between Soviet Union and China, and you know how the Chinese signaled it. All of a sudden they were still attacking Soviet Union. But the official statement was, our conflict with uh, uh, Soviet Union is a big, long-lasting, it will last at least 700 years. You see, all of a sudden, in a totally meaningless way, 1,000 becomes seven. So in this sense, I will reply to you, what you accuse me of now is 65% true. <laughs> but not totally, because unfortunately, I really like, I'm obsessed with. It's not only Malevich. You have a parallel movement with Malevich, and with, uh, in writing, Platonov, who also, later in the 30s, returned to a more traditional writing, and uh, one of the predominant readings is he simply had to do this because of Stalinist pressure and so on and so on. I claim it's a much more complex operation. There is a fidelity to his original position. The same as with Malevich. You know that famous self-portrait of Malevich? Late, very realist, but up, yeah. which means the square yes. is still here, yeah. and so on. But listen, I'm so sorry, my God, I'm so evil. Uh, where are we? Uh, that's incredible. Okay, let's go on. Uh, no, the last thing I wanted to say, let's, conf uh, let's conclude at this with that truth and uh, true exactitude, obsessional neurosis versus <laughs> hysteria. Uh, uh, I got into trouble by making a claim, but which I think is absolutely pro-feminist and makes the point clearly. It's a nice example. You know that uh, the way women who complain about rape are terrorized by police investigators is that, you know, when you are traumatized by rape, of course your report is not a pure objective description. You are traumatized, you get confused, you, uh, some things, uh, uh, you repeat yourself, not always telling the same story, and that would be my point. But for me, if anything, this inexactitude, the fact that your narrative is not truthful in this naive sense, object, is, if anything, from the subjective position, it makes, it guarantees the truth. Because I, although I, in principle, you believe a woman there, absolutely, of course, but I would have said that I would have been much more suspicious if a woman simply comes and in a cold way perfectly reports, you know. You see my point? The very inexactitude or small oscillations and so on are a proof that you are really subjectively caught into the situation that you are traumatically involved into it. In this sense, subjective truth can articulate itself through very, and so on, and so on, and so on. And especially, we don't have time to go into it, but this especially uh, uh, holds for Marxism. Because I think <coughs> what is unique about Marx is how Marx has an incredible theory of class consciousness, which is something quite revolutionary. The idea of Marx is that you can, Marx is not simply a subjectivist. Marx claims that there is an objective truth about certain social constellation. Marx is not a relativist, but his claim is that you can only arrive at this truth through, from a partial view through subjective engagement. 
And that seems to me the very key of Marxist notion, which is still at some level actual, <coughs> although not in the same form of class. Class consciousness is not you study society and you see where the developing is going and then you join the winners. Marxism is not an objective theory, which is ob simply objectively true. To arrive at it, you, it, you need a class position, the position of the exploiter, however you call it, and so on and so on. And this is something which can be put to provoke people even in theological terms. You know, the proper theological stance for me is not, I looked at the arguments and I become Christian, say, I'm not, because I was convinced by the arguments for Christ. No. I mean, like, if I were to be Christian, I would tell you, if you claim this, you should be burned. It's that you can only understand arguments for Christianity if you already believe. You know, this idea of a truth, which is an engaged truth, but no less objective. You know, this is the very core of Marxism, that objective truth is not, you claim this, you claim this, and then we objectively debate about this. No, objective truth is something accessible only from one, the right, subjective, engaged position. And if I may conclude and use my another standard line here. Uh, that's why, for example, when we fight all forms of racism, let me take my classic example, I'm sorry if you already know it, of anti-Semitism, old story. Let's say we are in Germany in mid-30s. I debate with a hardline Nazi about anti-Semitism. The moment I accept an objective debate, like, let's look now at your Nazi claims about Jews, are they true or not? I'm lost. I've sold my soul to the devil. Why? Because, I hope you know the story, I'm repeating it all the time, I'm here applying to, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> to anti-Semitism this wonderful provocative statement of Lacan that, it's a little bit male chauvinist unfortunately, that if a guy husband is pathologically or strongly jealous, even if his suspicions are factually true, his wife is sleeping around all the time, his jealousy is still pathological. Why? Because the point is not the objective truth of his jealousy. The point is why his fixation, why does he need such strong jealousy to sustain his subjectivity, his form of subjectivity? Why does he need jealousy? And it's the same with Nazi racism, anti-Semitism. The point is not, are Jews really the way Nazis claim they are? Once, and I was attacked for that, of course, I went even so far, maybe too far, when I said, even if most of the things that the Nazis claim about the Jews are true, their anti-Semitism is still false. Like, uh, because let's approach it in an objective way. We debate the Jews in Germany. There is the Nazi claim that Jews were exploiting Germans. Well, isn't it obvious, and I'm not anti-Semitic, that up to a point this was true. Some of the Jews, I underline some, were rich, and they were employing Germans, so in some sense, yes. Jews, another Nazi claim, were seducing German girls. Well, all I can say is I hope they did, and I hope they liked it, and I hope the other way. So, you know what I mean? The problem is a, the, a wrong question. The problem is not, is it true or not? The problem is, why does the Nazi worldview need a figure of a Jew to sustain its, its consistency, to function? That's the truth about it. This is the notion of dialectical truth. It's not with anti-Semitism. It's not, are Jews really like that? Who cares? Okay. Of course, we should. Sorry, yes? Ah. <coughs> I didn't organize that strong enough. You will again start to talk now, but whatever. <laughs> I thought I... Sorry, I cannot resist it. I'm so bad, but I cannot do it. Well, I'm just wondering... Ah, yes. If we take it... Uh, Please. Yeah, if ah, we yes. take it out of the example of um, the 1930s. Yeah. And if we talk about truth... Because uh, I think it's a very interesting discussion about 
truth here. I think it's extremely mm -hmm. interesting. And we talk about, um, is this on? Yes. 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 Okay. And we talk <coughs> about, um, let's say, Hillary Clinton. I, I really want to make this very contemporary. Yeah. Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump and Ted Cruz and the truth about the discourse of politics in the United States. Yeah. I mean, you don't have to use those characters, but they're good ones because yeah. Yeah. truth and falsity is very much at issue in the discourse around the mm. election in the United States right now. And there seems to be a lot of feeling that um, it, it doesn't matter if it's true or not, it has to be said a certain way. In other words, the lie that has to be said um, is uh, accepted as part of the way politics has to go on. You know, the Christian fundamentalists even has a term for this. They admit that I love them, lying for Jesus. Okay. But okay. it's different, but, I know, from a try, yeah. try to do it with uh, just, you know, um, Bernie Sanders tells the truth in a way. I mean, in other words, try to do it with a contemporary p uh, political situation. And they're, they're good ones because the truth and falsity of Donald Trump. Donald Trump tells falsities all the time, and yet they may be true. What do you mean exactly by they may be true? I mean, it is true. The system is, uh, he's calling the lies, he's, he's saying things that mm. can't be said. Um, so he's violating yeah. the laws, but in the process, even though he's lying when he violates yeah. them, there's something true in the effect, which I think is what allows him to survive. Because it's like you say, even if everything was proven incorrect mm. that he says, there's something still true about what he's saying. Yes. It's incorrect, yeah. but still true. No, no, I... Uh, uh, it's, uh, I, and now here, of course, I'm the first to admit it. It was easy for me to take that simplified example, anti-Semitism. But uh, uh, you know where things really get complex here? And I'm saying here from my personal experience, because for this I am lately ferociously attacked. The guy that I mentioned on my first class, the Bashi or whatever, he now wrote a new column from Al Jazeera, where you know with whom I'm put together. Breivik. Oh Breivik, the one, you know, our yeah. Norwegian friend who... Oh, oh my God. Yeah, I'm he sorry. said, Zizek and Breivik, European neo-fascists who want refugees out, and so on and so on. It's incredible. But, okay, uh, uh, in incidentally, you know where is his lie? It's incredible. He claims the Vashi, and it's an example, I didn't lose track about you. He says, A, Europe should open itself, where is humanity for all the refugees and so on, blah, blah, no? And then he says, a paragraph or two above it, he says, Europe is totally non-interesting today, it's in decay, it's out. Well, fuck you, can he decide? That's one big problem I see with those old post-colonialists. At the same time, they claim with such pleasure, you know, Europe is dead, it's out. It's United States, it's Far East, what are you doing here? You are in decay and so on. Well, fuck you, why then millions want to come here? I claim that still, Europe stands for a certain dream, which is not totally bad, I will put it like this, especially in these desperate times. Yeah, I wanted to provoke you, say, please. Well, um, no, I mean, Hamid Dabashi has his problems, and uh, I wouldn't uh, defend yeah. him as a truth teller, but I think it's really much more um, interesting, at least to me, than the fight that you're having with Hamid, is uh, what happens in um, legitimate discourse in a democracy today um, that, is, that makes lying okay, almost necessary, and yet other kinds of lies, because everybody's calling everybody online, right? And yet the whole system is, in a certain sense, a lie. Uh, yeah, the, the, yeah. the democracy of the system, and we can go to class uh, contradictions to demonstrate that and it, it can't be all-inclusive. And it, So there's a kind of, kind of intrinsic master lie that underlies the entire discourse. And yet it's argued about who is the best candidate on the basis of who's lying. <laughs> Something like that. Who is lying in a more, that would be an interesting in, point. In a, How should you lie? Yeah. And Are so, there different so types lies, of... It, so the big lie, everybody has to keep <coughs> going, whereas the people are being called on the smaller lies, 
or are they, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I just think that lying is extremely interesting in the case of the intrinsically contradictory politics of capitalist democracy. Yeah. Okay, let me go now step by step. I will try to. That's a wonderful question uh, or statement or whatever. First, I would say that here, more than ever, we have to distinguish the two levels that I meant because I think we have both extremes. We have the extremes of, on the one hand, of what you said, and I totally agree. That's what I'm trying to say. And this is what brings me all the animosity. I know I despise so much those in my country and so on, upper class liberals who simply dismiss, don't see the despair of whatever remains of ordinary working class people. It's so fashionable in Europe now among upper to dismiss them as, you know, proto-fascists or whatever and so on and so on. For me, I agree even with all those uh, uh, anti-immigrant populists and so on and so on. There is an element of truth in what they are saying. Not warning, not truth in the sense immigrants are really bad or whatever or whatever. But it's the same as with fascism even. I mean, fascism is a displaced anti-capitalism. Everybody knows this and so on. I mean, uh, we underestimate to what extent uh, uh, the Capitalist, sorry, Hitler's rhetoric was anti-capitalist. Yeah, 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 yeah. What? It's very good too. You know that. You know that. For example, when Japan, the worst, occupied most of East Asia, they called something anti-capitalist welfare region or whatever and so on. Sorry. It was the Greater East Asian Co-Prosperity Yeah, but, but, but again, the rhetoric was against Western financial uh, imperialism and so on and so on. So I know this may sound that I'm trying to sell you, but it's more complex. The old thing of how uh, uh, capitalism manipulates the anxieties of ordinary people and so on and so on. But although this may appear a, a flat stupidity, at a certain level, I was never comfortable with this simplistic dismissing as if we are just dealing with some racist uh, madness and so on and so on. So that what interests me, to return to you, uh, the most interesting phenomenon for me is when you don't even need empirical life, an ideal ideological system for me is the one which, at the level of facts, it can defend itself. That you sustain the big lie through factual, partial truth. And these intelligent populists in Europe are doing. For example, you defend refugees, and they say in Sweden, for example, <coughs> they bombard you with facts, and I asked my Swedish friends, and they told me it's desperate because up to a point they have right. For example, it's true that in Malmo there are, you have traditional Jews who are afraid to go out with all those girls, you know, and so on. The, how do you call them? Orthodox or whatever. No? That, uh, it's true that among refugees there are many sex crimes and so on and so on. It's true. Now, the problem is how to deal with this. And here I get into all my trouble. Because the predominant attitude of whatever remains of the more radical left seems to be we shouldn't talk about it, it helps the enemy. I claim desperately a way has to be found to address all these issues in a non-racist way. Can you put it into the matrix? of these fucking yeah. discourses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I cannot, I admit it, I don't know. Because, the, I mean, that's, that, ha that has to be possible, according to... Mm -hmm. No, 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 here I'm even more of an ordinary humanist. I know, but we're, tr we're trying yeah, to understand yeah. these concepts, yeah. so why does it not apply to these four... No, because, because as I already uh, replied to, to, to Jacqueline yesterday, oh. I don't overestimate these four 
discourses. I only claiming that concretely here that uh, I'll put it like this. Uh, what conservatives are calling lying for Jesus, you know where? I read an interesting, I'm sorry, you will be there, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I read an interesting analysis of how uh, some uh, uh, Catholic anti-abortion persons, they were caught lying about how abortion is dangerous for health, brings cancer, and so on, and so on. But they said we are lying for a good cause, to prevent a sin, so this is lying for Jesus, it should be okay. So Kant would not allow that? Yeah, but, ah, I didn't finish it there. So let me really, I, I'm afraid I get too easily distracted. I will just briefly answer you. But it's so interesting, the other two examples where Kant did allow lie. Uh, the second one is, well, sexuality. Kant says, well, children ask you about sexuality, you should lie. And he has a wonderful twisted uh, enlightenment argumentation. He said that if you tell this to children too early, they will get too excited, confused, and it will prevent them from becoming true rational persons, you know. It's a wonderful theory. The last one, wonderful, in his Metaphysics of Morse, Der Sitten, The Origin of Power. Kant accepts it that the origin of every power is illegal violence, that's why exploration of the origins of legal power should be prohibited. It should be a blind field because you automatically undermine power. But let's go on into this, it's much more interesting. Uh, the problem I see, the problem I see is this one. Uh, should we allow for the left or even, I had a couple of years here around the corner in that Marxism school today, Trotsky, a debate where when I just hinted that, are you aware that many of whatever remains of the working class are uh, also anti-immigrant and so on and so on? It was denied. No, you fall for Murdoch propaganda and so on and so on and so on. I, I, I think that this attitude of protection, let's not tell the truth, it will serve the enemy, is in the long term a catastrophe, and that we are paying the price for it. First, it's imminently racist, I claim. Because basically the attitude is we are treating Muslims like children, you know. They are not fully responsible, we shouldn't hold them accountable for, and so on and so on. I think it's a, I think it's a, I think it's a catastrophe. I know it's difficult. I know it's difficult because, uh, but, uh, uh, so again, coming back to, uh, to your point, the second problem is this one. When you said, say, the system is a lie, one should explore much more in detail in what sense the system is a lie. Because, for example, for a Hayek liberal, he would absolutely agree that the system is a lie that we live on credit, on authoritarian power, and so on, and so on. So uh, we have to define in a very precise way how system is lying. And I have here again a Hegelian criterion, which is we should never condemn it simply from the outside that the system is lying. It's imminently lying. You know what I mean by this? You got me here, incidentally, now I will write like crazy to answer your dirty question, oh my God. Fall again and shut up, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I cannot. No, because it was really a nasty, nasty in the best sense way question. Uh, you know what I naively believe? Let's say we have two types of elections. In election A, majority of the vo voters support racist, anti-immigrant -em politics and so on and so on. Let's say election B, referendum, where a miracle happens. The majority of voters vote for, even if they know they will suffer for it, I mean suffer, maybe a little bit materially, vote for. Maybe you will think I'm too humanist here, but I think it's strict theory and that I am right. I don't think that it's the same passion or whatever 
just once directed at good target, the other way at the wrong one, I claim the immanent structure is different. Now, I will say something terribly naive, but it can put it in non-moralistic terms. When the majority <coughs> votes in a racist way, in some way, and I'm, I'm not talking about their inner psychology, I'm talking about the very discursive structure, they know they are lying and it's somehow inscribed into it. I'm very moralist here. And on the other hand, when a miracle happens, and sometimes it happens. These are, for me, the most sublime elements of the only moments, maybe, of authenticity of electoral process. I remember some 30 years ago, even more, they had the first referendum in Italy on uh, divorce. And it was incredible how even the moderate left, at that time it was still Communist Party, when they were again, when they, of course, were for divorce, Privately, they were all pessimists. Like, but you know, people will be scared and so on. They didn't trust the people. Then, mega surprise for the Catholic Church and so on. Divorce got a yes, in spite of all the dirty church propaganda and so on and so on. These are authentic moments. Now, although in both cases, the impossible happens. It happens in a different way. In the first case, racists win, it's the impossible in the sense that you mentioned. What is Trump doing, to simplify to the utmost? He is, this is not all that he is doing, but rhetorically, and that's the decadence of our times. There were things, racist things and so on, which we were talking about, but they were not permitted in public space. Now they are more and more permitted in the public space. And I think this is becoming universal. Like, I was shocked. Do you remember that uh, Netanyahu accident, when was it, half a year ago, when he said that story about how basically Palestinians are responsible for Holocaust? You remember that, that Hitler just wanted to throw them out of Germany, and then that Husseini, that guy, the Mufti of whatever Jerusalem, told Hitler, but okay, then they will come to us. And Hitler asked him, okay, what should I do? And Husseini told him, burn them, you know. It's fall, but, but uh, my friend Udi Aloni told me that the shock was that this was an old rumor, but it was simply, you know, at the level of conspiracy theories and so on and so on. It was an obscene rumor. It was beyond dignity to use it in public space. And these are, for me, catastrophic elements that are happening all the time today. Look at torture. Are we allowed that torture was silently allowed? Again, we just think about it. How many things that 50 years ago, if you were to pronounce them publicly, you would have been excommunicated, no? They go on. And in a way, Hitler did the same. There was anti-Semitism in Germany, but at a certain level, it exploded into public space with Hitler. This is what they are doing, all this. But I claim with progressive victory, authentic one, something different is happening. It's not that this, what I call the obscene underside of the law, all these dirty rumors, that this is legalized. It's something quite different when you have the very normative structure which, uh, which uh, changes and so on and so on. So, uh, uh, so uh, my reproach, my difference would have been that uh, uh, I don't know where to locate here and this is what I will think about my big thesis of ideology which is that every ideological edifice has all is always inconsistent at split. You have the public speech and you have all the obscene rituals, obscenities and so on. I mean, I love them. Wait a minute, I was in the army, serving the army. It was my gold era. And uh, with what you discover in the army, it's incredible. It's how the situation is much more complex. Like, let's take my third example, gay rights. On the one hand, the army was, at least where I was, absolutely homophobic. 
Like, if a soldier was discovered, I was in the army in 75, 76 in Yugoslavia. If a soldier was discovered to be homophobic, sorry, gay, it was the usual ritualized violence. Every night, you know, this usual soldier beatings. Uh, two soldiers come to you, they put a cover or a pillow on your head so that you don't see who is around the bed and others take their belts and beat you and so on. It was ritualized violence. Okay, you will say, so okay, homophobic. Yeah, but at the same time, I didn't see any institution so totally penetrated by homosexual innuendos as the army. It was all around every time. For example, maybe you know, I'm sorry if you know the story, when we greeted each other in the morning in my unit, we didn't say good morning. You, sa you said, I'll smoke yours, which means fellatio. You know, like, I'll smoke yours nice after I finish with yours. It was, or everything, all the level, like, it was so vulgar. Our idea of a joke was, you know what? You wait in line for lunch, a meal, and then soldiers standing behind you, one of them quickly stacks a finger into your ass, pulls it out, you turn around, and then, ha ha, guess who it was, they all, like, it was so obscene. But what I'm saying is that, here I disagree with Judith Butler and those who think, oh, this is kind of obscene resistance. No, this is not resistance, this is central part of military, of functioning of a military community. I think that often, much more subversive than violating the explicit rule is violating not participating in these obscene uh, rituals and so on, you know. And what I am missing here to answer properly your question is how to locate these two levels, the inconsistency of every ideological edifice, how to locate it. Uh, how to locate it here. Because, again, this is, to conclude, this is, uh, oh my God, I'm talking too much. This is the big uh, element for me. This is what also gives us hope. This inconsistency of every ideological edifice. Ideology, ideology is never a consistent edifice. It has to cheat, to lie, to mask up, and so on, its uh, element. And, sorry, I, uh, sorry, I will just finish here. And, and uh, I don't think that the strategy, the strategy should simply be that only reactionary ideology is inconsistent, and so on, and so on. A certain type of inconsistency is maybe, I'm very insecure here, I know to what extent I can go, is maybe, part of the very, like, symbolic identity of us as humans. Again, the example that I maybe even used already here in the last days. What fascinated me always is this moment of, I'm returning to those presents and so on, of useless gestures which have a meaning precisely as useless gestures. Like, They're actually useful. Yeah, but in what sense? One has to be uh, uh, precise. For example, it happened to me with, I'm sorry if you know the story again, with Judith Butler. I was in such fear with her, that snobbish, shitty educational institute, <laughs> and uh, I did something unfair towards her, I admit it. I used some dirty words and so on. So I noticed she is displeased, so Afterwards, I called her to her hotel room and said, listen, Judith, I'm sincerely sorry, blah, blah. And of course, she was graceful. She said, I understand you, Slavoj. I know what you are. It was a nice ambiguity, like, <laughs> don't worry, I know what piece of shit you are. <laughs> but the point is this one, that she said, no apology needed, Slavoj, and so on. But then it got to me. This was the only nice way to accept my apology. Because if I were to apologize to her, and if she were to say, oh, I was really hurt, it's bloody well that you did, I deserve apology, wouldn't this signal that precisely she is still mad at me? Yes. Not. So, but you see the point. But I had to apologize. You see the paradox. 
Because in my evilness, my instant reaction was to tell her, okay, if no apology is needed, then fuck off, I take it back, you know. No, no, I should have. You see the paradox. The only proper way to do it is, I offer the apology, and the one to whom the apology is addressed proclaims it, it's not necessary. The function of this is precisely, okay, as you would have put it, it was useful, you know, we concluded peace. And I like this paradox, how something does its function precisely by proclaiming to be unnecessary. But it was necessary, it had to appear and be proclaimed retroactively as unnecessary. It becomes unnecessary in the moment that you, I mean... That? that you ask you, say you're sorry. I mean, Not it was necessary. necessary, and then it becomes unnecessary because the, the whole point was that, I mean, you would ask sorry. Yes, I, no, but the paradox is that she viewed it. It would be too rude for her to say what you said now. She had to say, it. oh, it wasn't necessary, and so on. You know, if she were to tell me, it's not necessary, but only now, after you said it, it would spoil the game. You see, see what I mean? It had to be... This is another temporal paradox here that how... I'm so sorry, we don't have time to go into it. It's the fundamental ideological mechanism of how things happen in a contingent way and once they happen, they are... It's as if they forever are what they become. Now, uh, now there is... Maybe you know the guy, Yurchak, some Russian guy, wrote a very good book on his socialist youth memoirs and the title is wonderful everything was forever and all of a sudden it was no longer and so on how each ideology retroactively creates its eternity and so on that's the basic mechanism i am i am referring to Slavoj, yeah we we worried that we're going to run out of time and you wouldn't have told us why you mapped capitalism and what's at stake in the it's, uh, But place. didn't you get the fucking text? Yes, but we want you to kind of do... No, it's yesterday. so simple. I, now I will tell you a secret. A sincere secret. Now I'm not lying. The reason of my constraint that so I did... not Sorry? Yeah, I'm lying, but okay, let's not go into all those paradoxes, you know, of lying, and if you admit that you are lying, are you also lying, and so on. There is a logic in it. It's a nice example of what I was saying. Isn't it that... You will not catch me. Miserable efforts to make me consistent. No, uh, it's much more tragic, listen. I am not satisfied by the text. I don't think it's yet finished enough. That's why I was so restrained and so on. Uh, the text that I send you, the four discourses mm -hmm. and so on, the solution is so simple. It's just that capitalism is necessarily split between discourse of the master and hysterical discourse. It's as simple as that. And that it stands for the two aspects of capitalism. Not master, sorry, university. University is all that Foucauldian topic or uh, Frankfurt School topic, domination, verwaltung, control, and so on and so on. And then you get the hysterical aspect of desiring subject and so on and so on. And that capitalism is defined by this tension. This was the first part of the argument. Oh, you have it all. The second part may be more provocative, or, or, although much not undeveloped. The second part is that uh, what we in some proto-communist uh, perspective should do is to risk a return to master's discourse. This is a very problematic. Uh, yeah, 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 I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's my bad side, how should I put it, you know. I admit it and so on, you know. But, uh, but I think, again, we should, <coughs> we should demystify a little bit the master's discourse. I mean, okay, but that's another topic. Can you topic. explain that? What do you mean by that? Demystify the master discourse? Yeah, because it's because so fashionable to immediately associate master's discourse with, you know, oppression or whatever, up and down and so on. I claim something like a gesture of a master is absolutely 
more than ever today part of every discursive field. Nowhere more than with feminists and so on and so on. What is transgenderism if not a new master signifier that is supposed to it's by definition a gesture of a master. New signifier it in a very normative way restructures the entire field with all implicit normativity and so on and so on. Show me one emancipatory movement which we is not based explicitly on this discursive uh, 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 gesture of a master. Then, if you want me to go on, you think you've heard the worst. No, no, you didn't. Uh, I politically, more and more, as I already emphasized, my position is, if I were to name for you the ideal order, my ideal political now, bureaucratic socialism, not Stalinism. The big failure of Stalinism was that it miserably failed in establishing a well-functioning bureaucracy. I mean, my point is very simple here, it's double. First, I'm sick and tired of these enthusiastic moments of, you know, one million people on Tahrir Square, on Syntagma Square and so on. Fuck it. What interests me is the day after. The only authentic measure of a social upheaval revolution is, and Trotsky had some wonderful lines about it from early 20s, when he said, revolution was difficult but in a way easy. Now it's the true task. How will we change ordinary life? The true test of revolution is, okay, we had a big moment, in Dagma Square, Costas was shouting there and so on. <laughs> what happens now? Now she is she's working for austerity. You know, you know what I mean? What, how do you see, feel the change when things return to normal? Mm -hmm. That's the only key change. And I think this is the big problem of the left. No, I... Okay, there were things happening, but very modest result. The second thing, uh, uh, I have also a problem with this logic of permanent engagement, you know, like this idea of uh, against, al I'm for alienation, to cut a long story short, absolutely for alienation. Uh, I think that, uh, that the, the most radical utopia, but utopia in a bad sense, it is utopia of against representative democracy that the system should be self-transparent, direct democratic engagement, councils, people engage, and so on and so on. My idea is that's wonderful. This is wonderful as far as it happens. But uh, are we aware that whenever you have something like this, you always already presuppose an extremely thick network of invisible, it can be state or whatever, social mechanisms smoothly functioning to have your stupid anarchic small self-engaged community and so on, who provides water, electricity, health and so on and so on. And for me, what interests me more and more is, and this is the true challenge needed more than ever today, because uh, uh, I read some interesting uh, critical analysis of democracy now, which claim that, you know, it's a very interesting point, that democracy works only in a relatively homogeneous society. Democracy works paradoxically when, in spite of all differences, we share a set of basic attitudes. This is why it's basically a nation-state democracy. The moment the difference is too strong, you have to negotiate, you don't do democracy. That's why, for example, in the Middle East, you cannot say, let's have a big vote, Palestinians, Israelis, everywhere. Or even more modestly, in, in Western Europe now, how would you democratically resolve the problem of immigrants? Through referendum, Certainly not. It would have meant probably in a situation now the majority would say throw them out. Okay, now you will say because they are excluded, immigrants. So what will you say then? Let's include them into the vote. Whom? Those who are already German citizens or 
now. You can also claim, why not I include them, those who are still in Turkey or where, but want to become German citizens or what? It doesn't work. I think this will be, the, we are approaching more and more problems which are not, cannot be properly dealt with, with what we know now as democratic principles. And I hate those leftists who don't admit this problem. That's why, I'm sorry if I repeat myself again, I, I don't idealize Angela Merkel. Although recently she again did something which was, I think, the only reasonable thing. You know what she proposed? And it was totally ignored by everybody. She proposed a couple of months ago that 10% of the budget of European Union should be set aside for refugees. It's a wonderful, simple solution. It doesn't solve anything, but at least it's a tremendous, we are talking about tens of billions and so on. It's the only, you know, all that stuff is just self-sabotaging, it's nothing. Again, this is where I see, to provoke you again, when you think I'm playing a totalitarian game with democracy. What Angela Merkel did, inviting refugees, it was clearly not democratically legitimized. But I think she did the right thing. Absolutely. Now, it's not simply that she was a dictator. That's what a great politician does. When you are in power, you make this type of right, emancipatory, risky decision, and you make a very dangerous wager that through actualizing your decision, people will be retroactively convinced about it. But you have to take the risk. So uh, this is even my problem. I'm sorry if I repeat myself with otherwise my good friend Varoufakis. No, I mean, don't kid me. What is this DM stuff and so on? No, I mean, what does it mean? Does he know what he's talking about with all this demo making decisions in Brussels more transparent? It would have been much worse. Mm. I know from delegates from Slovenia and others in Brussels, apropos Greece, they told me, if the decisions about Greece were to be public, it would have been much worse for Greece. Because all local members from different countries, they were under terrible pressure from their local constituencies, which means state, to be more tough towards the Greeks. So the transparency would have been even worse. It's the same with refugees. So, okay, I know then Varoufakis tries to squeeze out by saying something like, yeah, but because people are manipulated, we need real <laughs> democracy and so on. Okay, tell me how to do this. Not to mention the fact that, again, when you have certain type of antagonism, democracy is not a solution. You have to have another, I don't know, negotiating system or whatever, I don't know what. You... You, you cannot, and I think we are more and more approaching that. Let's say that ecological crisis will get more serious and so on. What will you do? A worldwide vote or what? Why not? Sorry? Why not? Because it's totally meaningless. It cannot be done. Why? Because it would have been totally manipulated. How can you guarantee even a minimal consistency? How is it possible that the economy becomes more global and politics National level, but that's like precisely but the that's paradox of global capitalism. No, because it's a political decision. No, no, yes, no. Global, I claim, I cannot go into it now in detail, but yes. I claim that global capitalism can only function with nation states. It's absolute illusion to think that at a certain point, parallel to global market, you will be able to get global state. Mm -hmm. However, if you do that, yes. it's already communism. In the sense that capitalism is already, you know, that's my problem with Piketty. I love Piketty. He makes a really no point. No wonder. Yeah, he makes the point that there's <laughs> listen. He wants higher taxes, no? Yes. But he's well aware that the only way to do it is on a global level. Yes. Okay. I that's the circularity I think of his argumentation. I claim that in order for this to be possible. It means that we, the people, are already in power. It means you have a global power with worldwide efficiency which is strong enough to squeeze the capital. Tell me how we will arrive at this. Because I claim 
His solution is basically Piketty's, I love also his work, but his solution is basically uh, once we already won, it will be easy to win there. <laughs> it's a circular solution, I claim. Also, you know where is his uh, illusion? Precisely in his realism. People don't take into account this. <coughs> Piketty basically accepts the fact that capitalism is the only game in town. Yes, he says we need to manage. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah, no yeah, yeah. It. But that's his illusion that we can have capitalism the way it is today, just with higher taxes and so on and so on. That's a model of what Hegel calls abstract thinking, I claim. You cannot. You cannot. The whole logic has to be changed. So I support him. Okay. But on this proviso, condition, that you should be aware that when you do something like what he wants, everything will start to change and you will have to go on and on and on. You know what I mean? But that, that's the way of life, isn't it? Oh my God, there is no way of life. Life is shit, I mean. <laughs> no, 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 I'm talking in a very concrete way. You cannot, again, this is for me the very definition of utopia, that you have a system just with some crucial no, change. Because he changed, no, because Piketty says really clearly, once we've changed the system, we need to keep on changing, and the process of change is going to go in turn for the rest of our, of the... Yeah, but then he contradicts himself when he says that capitalism is here to stay, and so on, and so on. Mm -hmm. Is it or not, or how? I don't think capitalism is here to stay. And this is not an optimist statement, like, oh, communism will win. This is a very pessimist statement. I think even, even, uh, even Hollywood knows it. I think the future is like Elysium, Hunger Games, and so on and so on. <laughs> I mean, seriously. I mean, look at books which predict what will happen with, uh, with, with biogenetics and so on. I claim if things go on the way they are, class system will re-emerge but in an infinitely stronger way. The ruling class will simply be literally almost another biological race. Mm -hmm. It's already happening. And how will we deal with it and so on? Okay, listen, uh, I disappointed you, I know. <laughs> so what I will do is I will send some <laughs> other stuff of political economy <laughs> to Madison, to you if you are stupid enough and I accept self-criticism and I hate you because you ruined my evening now and then. No, no, I take quite seriously what you ask because you were right, it's not enough to do this moralistic bullshit and so on. I believe in theory, you know what I mean. One has to provide the theoretical structure of what is happening today. Because I agree with you, something is happening and it's too easy to say, oh, it's the old capitalist game and so on and so on. I intend that once I even used the words of, uh, although I have fights with him, Chomsky that till now United States and others had a certain logic of manufacturing consent, how political choice, and that logic is breaking apart. And it's a moment which is moment of hope, but at the same time a very dangerous moment, you know. It's never to make fun of it when this... Because, you know, every democracy is not just explicit rules. It's a very complex process of manufacturing consent, how they are... Okay, let's call it a day. And tomorrow, unfortunately, we meet again, no? Unfortunately. Yeah, at two. Okay, fuck life. Ah, I go into this in my new book. Alienation with separation, of course. Yes. Alienation with separation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have this in my book also. Oh my god. This is the last one. Yeah, about alienation. Alienation with separation. Right. So that, that's that, right, 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 that's right out of the uh, out of Macron because yeah. Macron makes the comment. Yeah. 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 But he says I'm in favor of it, right? But that, that, yeah. then he's going to bring in separation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that would be interesting. Yeah. 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 That's not an easy thing. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well,
yeah. It looks like this disparities thing will be in transparities 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 th